go on holiday, go home. We're going home. Ireland is home. But of course, home is here for us now. And we have to sort of, hmm? once they get used to that, we have got used to it. This is home. <laughs> We'd like everybody on the platform there to do the haymaker's jig. Five ladies opposite five gentlemen, and we should have about three rows down the platform there. So the haymaker's jig. Okay, take your partners, and your partner stands opposite you in a row. Five ladies opposite five gentlemen. Already, Chris? Okay, where we go. <laughs> generation of Irish women and men who came to England in the 1940s and 50s brought with them their own distinctive culture and traditions. Like other immigrant groups, it has been important for many Irish people to maintain these traditions and pass them on to their children. your parents were Irish? Yes, very. <laughs> <laughs> how, how, how did that come across? Like, did, did, did that make them different? Did, um, did, did you see them as different? Yes, to, to it, made, it made us different to our neighbours, because most of our neighbours were English. Um, and it, we were different in, ev in every way. We were, we were different because we were Catholics, because my parents were Irish. Because we were, um, because we were involved in our, you know, parish and the school, and we went to Catholic school. And we, we were just totally different. The English was sort of outside our lives, and we were very aware that we were Irish because we went to Ireland every summer when we were little. And my parents um, consistently made us aware of our Irishness and our Irish backgrounds. You would get shamrock on St. Patrick's Day. You could do Irish dancing. You would have pictures on the wall of successful people. President Kennedy, Colonel Heaney, the Pope. Well, of course, the Pope is Irish, and we would never have had an Irish Pope. But President Kennedy especially was held up as a, an Irish Catholic who had made good and was indeed perhaps the most powerful man in the world. And you had that sort of input. Uh, even the football strips were the same colours as, as county strips. We had black and amber. Uh, most of our friends who've come to the house, a lot of our friends who've come to the house have been Irish. A lot of the records I have are Irish records. A lot of the books I have are Irish books. Uh, when we discussed politics, I discussed Irish politics and the history of it with my children. Uh, I've let them know where their roots are, where they came from. And uh, I've seen them songs I heard as a youngster, as a kid. And uh, they generally be funny Irish songs or songs about Ireland. Uh, my kids still say, remember me singing what my daughter says, the foggy Easter. She means the foggy Jew. Well, the foggy Easter, she calls it. She still says it. So they didn't, they didn't bash it into them that they were Irish. The London Irish Festival is held each year in Roundwood Park in Wilsdon. It's the largest annual gathering of Irish people in this country. It's a congregation of thousands in one area. One can roam around all day and one is sure to meet the boys and girls one went to school with. It is, of course, primarily uh, a day when we can bring along our children and grandchildren if we have them and, 
I'm being very Irish. I'm saying, now, look, isn't it great to be Irish? your daughter to do it? Because I love Irish dancing and I, I like dancing and I like them. What do you hope to do eventually with it? Become a teacher. Become a teacher for children. Do you see yourself as Irish or English? Irish. <laughs> Irish more than English. <laughs> what happens when you say that to somebody over here that you're Irish and not English? Well, I just say that you're not because I know your parents are Irish, but I don't believe that. <laughs> do you think you are more Irish than the, the yeah. people of your own age? So in our yeah. club, we're more Irish than the Irish. <laughs> We are. Like we go to Ireland and we get up and do Irish dance and everyone's sort of amazed that we can do it. Nobody over there can do it, sort of. They so don't bother. <laughs> but we do because we're in a, a country that's English. And so if you're in a country that's all full of English people, you try to be more... How do Irish people treat you when you go over, say, and they hear your English accent? They, they make a laugh of it. Yeah. <laughs> they can't really understand that. Yeah. And they say, like, um, oh, this is a chicken. Have you ever seen a chicken before? And things like that. Yeah. That's what you they do. They say it's just because we live in the, ca the, the city. Yeah. We, we've never yeah. seen a cow or a chicken or anything like that. Yeah. It's different if you've got relatives there because that you, they just say, oh, you're so-and-so's daughter, you know. Yeah. Or, oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> One of them, are you? <laughs> oh, I remember him as a little boy. <laughs> <laughs> Like, do they see you as English when you go over a place? Yeah. Do you think that your identity, like the bit of you that that your that your your Irishness, that the second generation who are here at the moment, that they'll hold on to that? Yeah. We, mm. Hope so. Definitely, we will. We will keep it going. Yeah. So the our our children, the second generation Irish, become socialised in our ways. And they also feel proud to stand in a crowd to which they belong and to which they can identify with, rather than to stand alone, isolated, as uh, they would as a second generation London Irish child. certainly goes a long way to give second generation Irish a sense of identity. We don't have to keep a low profile. We are ourselves.
festival is organized and supported by many of the associations and societies set up in this country by Irish people in the 1950s and 60s. Although upward of 70,000 people attend each year, most of the associations, and indeed the festival itself, are virtually unknown outside the Irish community. The county associations and most of the established Irish organisations were founded by the generation that came after the war and during the 50s. Doris, why were they formed and why have they kept such a low profile? Well, they started off initially as a group of people from a particular village or town uh, meeting in church or in the church hall and having a drink and a chat. And um, perhaps one of the members was ill or killed on a building site. And uh, so a benefit dance would be held again in the church hall to raise money to return the remains to Ireland. And the council's associations really grew out of that. The aims and functions of those societies are purely social and welfare. They have made a point of being apolitical. Um, I don't know if that was, that was necessary in the climate of the times in which we lived. I think a sort of, um, there's a conflict set up, a very, or juice set up at the moment, and possibly still today, a little bit stronger. The moment nice man comes over here, where is he coming to? He's coming to England, and the only reason, unless he's fleeing from something, he must be coming for better conditions, which immediately puts him in a, like, more Senegal, a sense of uh, insecurity, like, you know, he's coming to another country, because his own country of two points failed him. But where is he coming to? The country he has traditionally been brought up to regard as the enemy, you know, the old persecutor, you know. And this sets up all sorts of conflicts and hang-ups inside the man himself. He says, on the one hand, like, you know, well, uh, because this is a better place, or he used to say this is a better place to live than Ireland, you know. But then I wouldn't say that, like, you see. Then he allows himself the luxury of feeling bitter, you know, towards Ireland. But on the other hand, a certain of tribal loyalty keeps him from saying that either. He won't say that, you know. And uh, so from this confusion, I think, a sort of uh, certain circuitry emerges, emerges and they say, well, uh, we won't involve in this, that, or the other. Like we don't feel as strong or as as, as, uh, as stiff as we say in Ireland. We won't feel as stiff here as we would in America. And when an Irish person mentions the word politics, it immediately springs to mind, to the mind of the hearer, terrorism. They equate Irish politics with terrorism, and so the Irish associations avoided any hint of political involvement whether that political involvement was local government or merely community relations. Steve, what accounts for the low profile of the older generation of Irish people here? I think assimilation and the desire to assimilate accounts for a lot of it. Do I think that is changing now? I think also that, again, it's not wanting to be in the public eye or draw any attention to yourself. There's a long tradition of anti-Irish feeling in this country. And I think a lot of people feel that they do well to keep out of the way. How do you think Irish people in this country are seen by English people? I think they're looked upon as second-class foreigners, not quite as unacceptable as perhaps the blacks or the Asians, but nevertheless, still unacceptable. I think they look upon their customs and habits, the culture as alien, and as somehow not something to be appreciated, something to be detracted all the time. I think very much the impression is the Irish stereotype is still in force. Oh really? Did you hear about the Irishman and went to the dentist to have a wisdom tooth put in? It was a bit like the Irishman who wanted to be buried at sea. All the grave diggers were found. Paddy's lights on the car weren't working. So he said to Mick, get out there, Mick, and we'll test the lights. Mick went out the front. He said, now, are the side lights on? They are. 
Are the headlights on? They are. Are the indicator working? They are. They're not. They are. It makes me angry, but I don't admit it. Because in admitting my anger, I am showing that I'm allowing to, someone to get at me. And truly, that's another part of the Irish joke. It's to get at us, to anger us, to annoy us, and to perhaps to whip up our anger and have us run true to form as the stereotype. But many of the jokes that you are referring to have a sting in their tail. And they are repeated, repeated in one's workplace. First thing in the morning, did you hear that Irish joke you heard last night? Wasn't it great? And everyone falls around laughing. And then suddenly they clam up and become quiet and say, shh, I mustn't, I mustn't because she's there. So, Sadly, the, the British image of Irish people is sadly lacking. Um, and it's uninformed. I think it's an unconscious image stemming from this sort of colonial, imperial um, background to the personality that they treat all foreign people as inferior and the Irish people as a joke in particular. Actually, that's not really fair because they're not stupid, they're very clever people. During the last water shortage in Ireland, they diluted every last bit of water they had to make it go from it. <laughs> what do you get if you cross an Irishman with a pig? You get some nice thick bacon. The English idea of what the Irish are like, the sort of typical stereotype of all Irish being ignorant, drunken navvies, um, was a threat to you when you were younger. And even though you knew it wasn't like that, Nevertheless, there was some little bit in your brain that made you think, well, maybe they are. And you had to sort of try and not, not let the two come too close to each other. Otherwise, that sort of problem would rear its head and you would have to choose between them. As I went into my teens, I just thought it was best just, just to ignore the Irishness, not just to play it down, just pretend it wasn't there. And not to deny it, but just to manage without it. I think the Irish joke works on two levels, really. First of all, it makes it easier for the English people to ignore what's going on in their name in Northern Ireland. The anti-Irish joke paints the Irish as being ignorant and quite often subhuman. And if people are ignorant and subhuman and stupid, then it's easy to accept children being shot down in the street. It's easy to accept mass internment. It's even easy to accept young men and women willing to give their lives on hunger strikes because it's just an Irish foible. It isn't actually the, the actions of a rational person or rational people. So I think it serves that purpose, and I believe it always has served that purpose. There's nothing new about the Irish joke. The average British person wants to forget Ireland, the way of like stopping a movie say, let's forget all about that. And can we sort it out from here? Whereas Irish people have the opposite way of looking at things. Let's sort out what's going on now because of what has happened in the past. Mm. 
and that's one of the very strong tensions between the Irish and the British and how they see one another. English stereotypes of the Irish have a long history. In the 19th century, British newspapers caricatured Irish people as subhuman, psychopathic and obsessed with violence. These images were particularly popular when the struggles against British rule were at their most intense. Their effect was to deny Irish agitation any political significance in the minds of the British public. Irish agitation over land reform is depicted in this cartoon as a devilfish engaged in mortal combat with a heroic Gladstone. These kinds of racist attacks were not only confined to cartoons. The Irish hate our order, civilization, liberty and pure religion. This wild, reckless, indolent, uncertain and superstitious race whose history describes an unbroken circle of bigotry and blood. These representations of Irish people reinforce Britain's continuing role in Ireland as a civilizing force, struggling against irrational religious and political traditions. Whereas these traditions for Irish people have been central in sustaining the struggle against British colonialism. Many Irish people coming to Britain have carried these traditions with them. Well, the longest memories I have now at home has been put on a stool in the kitchen and made recite at length old Michael Dwyer, you and your trusty men are hunted over the mountain and tracked into the glen. Sleep not, but watch and listen. <laughs> That's low and bless us. That's the kind of a tradition you will now know. You know what that is? In independence, Republican tradition, let's face it. I blame you now for being a Republican, but you'd be that anyway when you got to learn things. My experience was where we lived, there weren't the washing machines and spin dryers in them days, what I saw, pity. But they had uh, a mango, somehow. you know the old mangoes, you've seen them, haven't you? Up the top of the yard. And probably each family would have a, a turn each day were doing the washing and using the mango. And my mother would be turning that mango, putting the washing through it. And, and of course it was blankets or something like that. It was pretty hard work, I'd imagine. And if you were unlucky enough to be the young that was caught, I need you to turn the mango. You turn that mango. Of course, you'd be turning it. Maybe a couple of you. Mm. And my mother would be singing those songs, uh, tricolored ribbon, all those, uh, all around me, half I wear, tricolored and Bo Rubber Dennett, and uh, that's where I learned the words of these songs. I won't say I remember them all, but I learned most of the Repu bedrock Republican songs. You wouldn't learn them at school, mm. and they weren't popular on the radio, were they? Mm. At school then, what, what did you learn about Ireland? Well, the general attitude was that Ireland was somehow inferior to England, both religion and historically. And Ireland was some riotous rabble across the sea that didn't know how to behave and there was poor Gladstone trying to sort them out and his sort of successive attempts to do that you know you have to do all the different home rule bills and the general attitude of our O-level teacher an English Catholic was that that you know, wasn't Gladstone foolish to waste his time and energy on trying to sort the Irish out when they were quite obviously never going to be sorted out and they would never behave themselves and he ended up sort of wrecking his career on it and wasn't it a waste and um, something else that sticks out in my mind very vividly was when we did the um the 1916 rising and at the base of the rising was the post office in dublin and she considered that hilarious that the irish had a post office as their base she sort of poured contempt on that that really made me angry and i had heard a different version of the rising in 1916 from my grandparents too um, and their version was that um, you know here was here was sort of young men fighting and dying for what they believed in and it was um, just as important to them as any war say that the English have fought um, and yet in school it was just um, dismissed as you know that unruly lot over there misbehaving yet again did that create any conflicts in you 
it would have done if I'd let it, I think, but I just separated them so much. They were just quite separate. And so I didn't think about them and compare one to each other. I didn't let that conflict arise because I knew it would have been difficult. So I just kept them in separate compartments and just kept that at school. We learnt things, did things from an English point of view, and at home, things were from an Irish point of view. The re-emergence of the conflict in Northern Ireland in 1968 had a major impact on Irish people in this country. Our cultural and political traditions were once again under attack. The civil rights movement took to the streets to protest against the discrimination suffered by the Catholic minority since the formation of the Northern Ireland state in 1922. The unionist response to these demonstrations was brutal and their repressive methods were finally instrumental in British troops being sent in in August 1969. The Protestant majority became increasingly entrenched and refused to concede any substantial reforms. We, the Unionist Party, and indeed the Orange Institution, have nothing to be apologetic for in the treatment of the minority in this country. This response on the part of the Unionists, coupled with an increased use of violence by the British Army towards the Catholic minority, transformed the struggle for civil rights into a war aimed at removing British presence from Ireland. I remember coming in from school one day and normally when I came in, my dad got back from work about the same time so we'd all eat together. And this day we didn't, he was watching the news and told me to sit down next to him and watch it with him. And we heard on the news that 14 people had been murdered in Derry by the power to us. And it's the first, the first time I can remember my dad actually being really angry about something. And he was truly incensed. And it was the reaction I later found out with other people within the community. And he said that we should join the IRA. And my mother was very upset about that. Because even though they didn't sort of say much, they knew what was going on. What effect did that have on you? Well, I was willing to join the IRA if they did. I thought that was the logical thing, that if people were going to be killed because they were Irish Catholics, and it was no use waiting for your turn. I was only 14. It certainly made me think, and in many ways is responsible for the way I think now. It made me realize that you had to make a decision to be English or Irish, that there was no middle ground. I do identify a lot with the problems of the people in the North, and that it's made me um, assert my Irishness much more to English people around me and to other Irish people too who might not be from the North just because I, I, I have had some experience of what it's like to, to live in the North my family have told me the sorts of problems that the, just the problems they have in day to day living but the majority of my friends of Irish parents and people from the south of my parents age as well I think the North really has sort of embarrassed them and they sort of they they came over here 20 years ago they were you know there was prejudice against them at first but they've worked hard and you know and they've done they've worked hard and they've got their children educated and they've sort of gone up sort of, cl sort of climbed up the ladder and they've got their little niche now and I think the problems in the north have just sort of unsettled them because people say oh you know you're Irish, it's your lot that are doing that, doing that bombing and all the rest of it. And I think the majority of people are even more keen to deny their Irishness now. Well, perhaps to say, I'm Irish, but... As the war in the North escalated, the conflict was increasingly represented in the British media by images of violence and destruction with little attempt being made to look at the historical and political background to the situation. 
This representation of the conflict is repeated in a different form in newspaper cartoons. As in their Victorian counterparts, these cartoons portray the Irish as violent, aggressive, and obsessed with destruction. These sentiments are also repeated in the opinion columns. There they go still, the Irish path rats, with minds locked and barred, mouths gaping wide, to exude the very last morsel of folly, and consumed with a wild terror that sense may one day prevail. And once again, these images are used to justify Britain's civilizing role in Ireland. It makes it easy for the English to ignore the Irish over here, and the Irish protest over here, and the reaction even against the jokes themselves from an Irish person can be ignored. They can't really be upset about that. It's just a joke. So it really has the effect in total, I suppose, have given the English people the ability to be both contemptuous and aloof from anything the Irish people may say. In the early 1970s, sections of the Irish community in this country organised political protests in response to the events in Northern Ireland. We will stay on the streets and will fight against oppression. There was a terrific feeling in 69 onwards. Uh, 70, was it 71, 72, we had the bloody Sunday in Derry and that, that those lads were boarded by the paratroopers. And they, uh, there was this feeling in trade union branches and that was a great backing in the labour movement for the uh, civil rights and uh, decent and when it was starting to be explained after all these years, we've been saying it for years, but the world's television and press were saying, here are people in the British Isles, what's known as the British Isles, being deprived and being, uh, having the position where not only were you able to walk, but your father never walked and probably your grandfather never had a job. When that was explained from places like Newry and Derry and on West Belfast, uh, the British Labour movement were, were waking up to it. And we start playing our part, the Irish here, those of us who were doing a job, made, made it public and laid on platform for speakers from the six counties and all the rest of it. Now, there's been changes, of course, they didn't like that. Powers to be, and they brought in this Prevention of Terrorism Act. Open fascist legislation, you know. Uh, I think it's been much like it since Goebbels. The Prevention of Terrorism Act, which was introduced in the wake of the Birmingham pub bombings, has been almost exclusively used against the Irish community. The provisions of the Act include exclusion orders, under which people can be excluded from Britain without trial, solely on the orders of the Home Secretary. Arrest and detention. Once arrested, a person can be held for 48 hours, and then for five days on the authority of the Home Secretary. The person need not be charged during this period or brought to court. I think it was introduced to stifle any Irish opposition to what was going on in the north of Ireland. And has been very effective. It hasn't been effective in combating the Republican military activity over here. We know this. There have been probably a dozen or so bombings over here during the time it's, it's been in effect and no one has ever been caught for it under the Prevention of Terrorism Act. The, most of the people who have been jailed under the Prevention of Terrorism Act, have had to be released without charge. It is, in fact, a, a means of inspiring fear in the Irish community. And it has been very effective. Of the 5,500 people detained under the Act up to December 1982, only 7% have been charged. And only 2% of those arrested charged with offences under the Act. The NCCL report on the Act in 1981 concluded that the injustices which the operation of the Act have so far caused in their use against the Irish community in Britain have already led to fear and alienation amongst ordinary law-abiding families. It shouldn't give the police such powers. What, what kinds of powers do you think it gives them that you don't think they should have? I don't think that they have any right to come and um, 
as it were, kick your door in at four o'clock in the morning, as they have done to Irish people, and take them away and hold them for seven days incommunicado. I don't think that that should be allowed at all. I mean, I, I know of people. I don't actually know them, but I know of people that were held in, in that north, last North London. Um, a lot of people that they brought in. Mm -hmm. and, and the reports that we got back, the treatment was shocking. I mean, one man just would not eat or drink anything in the police station because he said everything was drugged. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you think it's made, that kind of act has made Irish people more insecure in this country? Oh, I, I do. I certainly do. I mean, there is, there is just one organization, I gather, that can get any information about uh, if, if somebody is taken in. The, the um, organization called Release, and they're the only people. I mean, my brother rang me at, at uh, midnight to ask me for that phone number, because somebody from Haring Irish were, were taken in at that particular time. And he said jokingly to me, you better leave it handy. And I said, what for? He said, they might come and kick your door down. I said, don't be daft, I'm not involved in anything. He said, it's getting to the point, the mere fact that you're Irish. Mm. You can be, they, they, they will, if they feel like it, just drag you in off the streets. Uh, prevention of terrorism act is something where the people have got to realize. Uh, it can be used against everyone, never mind the Irish. It can be used against us, any group of people, discussing, and they can be just taken in, held, no charge, no access to nothing. I don't even know, I understand you, not even make, sometimes keep even your clothes on. And held for us, I don't know, for seven days, I believe, for that matter. Well, you know, unless everyone wakes up, and the whole British Labour movement wake up, it will be all disappeared, like in Holland, like in the Argentine. And that's what we have them probably dropping in the ocean with concrete boots and all that business. And unless people are prepared to wake up, and uh, you know, they can't get access to someone for seven days. Christ, where's the freedom? It can be used against anyone. It's terrible. It's fascist legislation. It's got to be opposed. Well, the first effect that I felt immediately was the Irish stopped talking in the pubs. First indication. The wearing is free talking. Why is that? The obvious thing is it was, it was fear. You know, I was in the Irish Center at that time. And there was people living opposite the Irish Center there. And the fellas were going out, you see, and uh, they would sing outside some of these fellas. That, that they were at the county dinners, you see, and they hadn't seen one another for maybe a whole year. And they were having a bit of a celebration, and they went out and they sang some old song from the country at home. And you see, people across ring the police. The police down, you see, there's, this place is a den of iniquity. <laughs> see? <laughs> see, well, uh, it had effect, of course, because one morning at half four, a whole ten, three or four tender loads of special branch come down to read the whole centre to look for guns and bombs and all the rest of it. All nonsense, of course. I think the PDA explained the, the dearth of Irish political activity from when it was introduced up to possibly last year. It's a known fact that special branch men and the like of it at one time probably still do hang around bars and places where Irish people are known to meet. And it's also been known that as a result of that perfectly innocent people have been taken off to jail and held for seven days without their families knowing where they are. People are scared of that. So obviously they take precautions. And probably the greatest precaution, probably the most foolish one as well, is that they, they opt out of any political statement they might make, out of any opposition they might give to it.
In 1981, 10 Republican hunger strikers were allowed to die in the H-blocks in Northern Ireland. Their deaths deeply affected the Irish population in this country. I think the death of the hunger strikers have really changed. And certainly for the better. The Irish people's attitude to politics, the Irish people living here anyhow. I think stemming from that, people were dissatisfied with the old way of representation, if it could be called such, for years. And this is a generalization. I accept that there are probably branches of the Federation or perhaps branches of county associations who have always been to the forefront of trying to better the lot of the Irish people, either here or in Ireland. But generally, we have not done anything like that. They have suppressed political activity within their community. They have consistently apologized for the acts of other Irishmen and Irish women and have refused to take a very strong stance against the acts, indeed the atrocities of the British state. How are people trying to uh, organize in an alternative way? We try and work on four levels really. Obviously we want to promulgate and preserve the culture. Obviously we want to combat racism. And obviously we want to remove the Prevention of Terrorism Act. And finally, of course, we do have a great interest in what happens in Ireland. We do want the British withdrawal from Irish affairs. We do want to see United Ireland in our time. To do this means a great deal of work. We have to lobby local councillors. We have to get sent to the local government to make provision for the Irish people. It means changing school curriculum. It means getting community centres. It means, for the more political aspects, lobbying MPs and quite simply talent MPs that if they don't deliver the goods, we won't deliver the vote. Uh, we, we, we will have a future only if we unite. Um, if we organise and if we get a voice. We have contributed to building this country after it was broken by the war, the last war in Europe. We have given our labor, our expertise, our lives to the societies in which we live, the society in which we live. And it is now time that we stood up and stood up and be counted as part of the society. We've lived apart from the society. We've deluded ourselves that we are going someplace, that we're in transit. We're not. We're here. We're permanent.